Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about safety. And uh, one of my, it's a very hot topic, and one of my major points is that safety is not really one thing, it's, it's lots of things. Even the introduction pointed uh, that out indirectly. Um, so there's some pictures on my slides to show that you can provide really high reliability, um, good software. That picture is from the uh, web telescope. It is really difficult to send a repairman to L2 if something went wrong. So we, we can write reliable, good software. That's one of my points. But there is a lot of challenges and I'm going to talk about them. I'm going to start about what is safety and seeing the challenges. Then I'm going to go through C++'s evolution showing how we over the years have improved in these areas. Then I'll show the core guidelines, how we today can write uh, demonstratively safe software uh, using guidelines. And then I will go on one step further, trying to see how we can standardize that kind of stuff so that we can actually get guaranteed type and resource safe C++. So that's uh, the journey I'm going to try and take you to. So here's the challenge. This comes from the spooks the uh, NSA guys, and they basically say you have to avoid writing C, C++ uh, because it's unsafe. Now, I sort of agree. I don't like C, C++. It's a mythical language and usually, um, usually a mess. And uh, if you want to write everything in low level C or in, in some strange mixture of C and C++, Yes, you're going to get messy software. So I've been arguing against that for, well, I don't know, 30 years. And um, I'm going to take you to the, um, to, to the tour through um, what I think we've been doing. But this is a challenge. Important uh, organization says you shouldn't write uh, C, C++. Uh, and they, they, I don't know what they mean, but I want us to write C++ because we can do good with it. And so it's a, it's a reason for concern. It's not a reason for panic because we started solving this problem decades ago. Uh, also, uh, there are other things going on in the world that shows that this kind of concern isn't the only one that's happening. I mean, C++ made it to uh, Tiobi's uh, um, language of the year last year. It grew more than any other language on the planet. And uh, I guess beyond, because C++ is beyond. I, I do not know, oh yeah, by the way, all the surveys as opposed to, uh, to, um, to, to, to TOB says that there's more C++ than there's C. Because when you do a web search for the letter C, um, you, you can get the, the more things. So uh, I'm, I don't usually quote TOB for that reason, it measures noise. So maybe all of this discussion about safety and unsafety was what caused C++ to go up. Uh, controversy uh, sells and it goes on the web. Anyway, it shows that there, what we do matters uh, to a few billion people um, for good and bad. So let's make it good. Okay, so we must address the safety issue. Um, there are serious problems, and people writing C slash C++ are doing harm uh, quite often. And um, we, we, we can do massive improvements in, in, in a variety of areas. Um, and uh, if governments and organizations start uh, banning C, C++, meaning we can't write C++, a lot of us in the trouble, and the alternatives, by and large, are not better. The people that chose C++ today are not stupid. And uh, the alternatives are new, shiny, and are largely untried, and doesn't handle the range of applications that C++ does. So um, we can't annoy it, we can't ignore it. And on the other hand, it's something we've been trying to do for a few decades, at least I have. And um, so what have we got here? 
the idea, the aim for, for C++ back uh, in the er er earliest days was that um, we wanted a, a type safe language. Uh, Dennis Ritchie said that C is a type, it's, it's a strongly typed weekly check language. That doesn't scale. That is, being careful doesn't scale. We, we need support for uh, writing the kind of software that uh, Dennis envisioned. He was competing with assembly code, and I envisioned <clears throat> trying to deal with problems in C and other languages. And, and basically, we, we can write safe C++ for just about any definition of safe um, by being careful. I want guarantees to back up so that it careful isn't enough. And by the way, I don't want to limit us to what we can write. One of the problems with a lot of languages is that they can only express what their designer or designers uh, thought was good. I got badly bitten by Pascal each time I wanted to do something interesting. I couldn't do it because Nick Klaus Wirt had decided it was bad for me. Uh, you will have noticed with C++ you don't have that problem. Um, and uh, I don't want to add, um, add runtime overhead because performance is one of the things that matters to a lot of applications. And so um, it wouldn't be C++ if we say checked everything at runtime and ran uh, at roughly the speed of say Python. Uh, nothing wrong with Python, it just isn't for the key applications of C++. Okay, so this is what I have been aiming at for a long time, type and resource safety. Every object accessed according to the type with which it was designed, defined. Simple enough. Every object is properly constructed and destroyed. That is, don't use uninitialized variables and don't leak resources. Um, every pointer points to a valid object or is a null pointer. That one is hard, means no dangling pointers. Well. We know how to do that. I'll show you. And um, uh, every reference to a pointer is not through the null pointer. That requires uh, some runtime checking, right? I mean, you have a pointer, it might be the null pointer, so you have to check. And uh, every access to a scope scripted pointer is in range, no range uh, errors. So um, basically, if we can do that, we can claim type safety. And we can claim resource safety too, because there was a no leaked part on this. And that's, that's important if you send things in places where you can't run out of resources. And uh, so uh, that, that's basically it. It's what C++ requires, read the manual, and C requires it too. It's just that you have to be careful, and being careful isn't good enough. So um, I'm going through what we have been doing, I'm going through the rules that will do it, and then I'll end up with some work I'm trying to do uh, with people in the standards committee to, to get the enforcements uh, standardized in some way. So, um, constraints. C++ really has to support a, a lot of people in, in a variety of, of areas. Um, we, we, we can't just say, take all the unsafe stuff and let it be done in another language, which is one of the things that this, uh, the safe languages do. They uh, take the stuff and then they call C or C++ and then they blame them for not being safe. We can't do that. We're the ones that has to take care of uh, that last bit there. And also, there are billions of lines of codes and there are uh, millions of heads that carries the uh, their legacy ideas in them. So we, 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 we can't just say, throw it all away. We have to provide a path from what we have today uh, to, to a modern contemporary uh, C++. And uh, well, it's not going to be easy, uh, but, but we should do it. And uh, we have to remember that stability is a feature. We can't just break everything. Even if we try, there are people who will just stay with what they have. If we stop developing C++, they will stick to C++ 98, 11, or whatever it is, and the world would not be any better. 
We, we have to make changes, we have to make improvements, but we have to do it so that people can come along. Stability, uh, code written 10 years ago, still has to run for the places where uh, we can't do the upgrades quite yet. So the challenge is, is to describe what it means to, to be type safe. Uh, no violations of the static type session, no resource leaks. That's easy to say, but it takes a lot to get all the details down. And we have to then to convince uh, the developers that that safe code, safe style of coding is, is actually in their interest. And we still have to have direct use of hardware resources and need for uh, support, efficiency where uh, it's needed. I mean, not everything has to be ultimately uh, efficient, but a few things do. And we, we would like to guarantee uh, safety. And uh, yeah, again, there's a lot of great C++ out there. We don't want to break it. We don't want to lose it. We want to make it better. Uh, so we started a long time ago, uh, before some of you were born. And um, C++ was designed to be evolving. I, I knew very well that I couldn't design the perfect language right now. It was just me, there was no development team. Uh, and apart from that, I couldn't define perfect. Uh, perfect changes with time. We change, the world change, etc., like that. Um, so I, I designed it with the aim of evolving, with the aim of um, being able to uh, address new challenges. But the, the root of this, the, the, the thing that was the key to, to all of this was the static type system. Static and extensible. Um, that's what, you, what the idea was. Okay, and uh, also I realized that being the best at one thing allows you to write really nice papers for academic journals, but it's not the way you build a system. You have to be good enough at everything that matters to your users. And so uh, have to keep that in mind because again and again we see people saying C++ is useless because it's not as good as this for that. Well, what about that and that and that? Okay, fine. Uh, so um, efficient use of hardware coming from C and manage complexity based on uh, simula. Notice the managed complexity. I didn't say object-oriented programming. I just want my code to look better, easier to read, uh, safer, and such. And th those are overarching aims, and they are, uh, they, they still are. Uh, that was the machine I was using at the time. Uh, Dennis Ritchie, Ken Thompson, uh, showing off early Unix. Um, anyway, that was when where it started. And uh, so the first thing I did, actually the second, uh, I'll get to constructors, destructors, but the first thing really uh, fundamentally was let's get argument typing, uh, argument checking in place. Uh, C didn't have it. And it's essential for just about anything. But it was incompatible. Uh, wait a minute, do I have some code? No, I don't have some code. Um, so basically, in old uh, C and KNRC, you couldn't say what the argument type was. And uh, therefore, uh, taking the square root of two is a disaster because two is not a floating point number. If you're lucky, your system crashes. If you're not lucky, you get the wrong answer. Um, and that kind of stuff had to be fixed. And for the next 10 years, I had to take criticism for not being compatible with C because I wouldn't accept square root of two unless you have declared square root to take a double so that it knew it could convert. So that's one of sort of the very early things. It has to do with safety. It, uh, systems don't crash very much. Also linkage was done so that you couldn't link things that was incompatible. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but it was 99 point something perfect. And I'm an engineer in that sense, not a mathematician. So um, having something almost never happen is, is often good enough. We'll see. And, but it was getting the type safety for the um, function argument calls and for the linking is essential for just about anything else we do. 
Um, the, a key idea in C++ actually was to represent ideas in code. I really don't like to be the, the, the compiler. I write something and then I have to think about what, what's happening and uh, I have to translate my ideas into pointers and bits and bytes. I mean, compilers are good at that. So we have to have a way of expressing things and there's a, a, a list of uh, ideas of things I would like. Uh, some of them are standard now, everybody's using them, and I would say everybody is using all of these things, it's just whether they're standard or not, I would like more of them to be standard. Um, well, that's what the computers looked like at the time. Um, the, the, one of the really key ideas to do with uh, not crashing and such is uh, RAII, resource acquisition is initialization, which must be the dumbest name for a great feature that I, well, anyway, the apologies for that. Uh, I was busy. Uh, <laughs> Basically, that came in in the first two weeks of uh, civil classes, became C++. Basically, you can acquire resources when you build an object, and you can give them back again when you're finished. This seems very simple. I was a systems guy. I've been do doing operating systems and hardware. I mean, what else could you do? And um, apparently, that was not as obvious as I thought it was. But... Um, that, that's the key, resource management. A lot of what we do has to do with getting things from somewhere and have to remember to put it back. You know, being careful isn't good enough. We know that when people have to give it back, they forget. Ask any librarian. This is not anything to do with computing, really. It's fundamental. Okay, so uh, a resource is, is just anything you have to give back. Uh, locks, sockets, uh, shaders, uh, file handles. The shaders is a real example. I got it from some graphics people doing high-end high, high -end graphics. Um, Object-oriented programming was, was, was really cool, and uh, I, I, I like the encapsulation idea. I don't really want anybody to mess with uh, the private data of my class. That's, that's the, the key to that. Uh, some people have forgotten it these days because they, they don't think that somebody else might do something bad like that. Experience shows that if something is available, it will be accessed and used. There's some kind of law about that too. It happens. And so I, I like encapsulation. That was a key idea, abstract base classes, key idea. Again, protecting your resources, making sure that they don't get corrupted. It's another word for safety, isn't it? Anyway, uh, and I needed overloading so that we could select things based on properties that are static. That is, we pick the right algorithm or we pick the right type based on uh, what has been declared, making things more declarative. Uh, oh yeah, uh, the coffee machine there. Uh, it's not just spaceships. It's also everyday things. I mean, the world doesn't come to an end if, uh, if, if the software for that thing crashes. But on the other hand, my favorite definition of a programmer is a machine for turning caffeine into code. So this is an important gadget. And it is programmed in C++. Um, so here's a little example of uh, little things that can help code immensely. Um, say the range four. If you do a range four, you don't have to check the access for every access in the range because it only works for the range. You, you can range check at the beginning and the end if you want to, but a lot of times you, you actually know in the type system that you are in range. So that's safety and performance. And uh, SPAN is a, a, a version of using that that has been immensely useful at large scale systems and people don't talk about it, it's too simple. All it is, well, you have a pointer, it points to something. In a pointer in C++ and C, you don't know what it really points to. Is it no elements? It could be the null pointer, you can check for that. Is it one element? Is it 99 elements? You can't do range checking on this thing. It's <coughs> inherently complicated. There's not the right information to do the job. <coughs> I was actually talking to Dennis Ritchie about that um, back in the old days. And he couldn't get the C committee to agree to uh, have something like a span, which is the pointer with the size attached to it. He called them fat pointers, I call them span. Uh, 
Uh, they are now uh, in the uh, in the standard, and so you can, <coughs> if you instead of passing a pointer, comma, an integer, you can pass a span. The span remembers what the size is. You can now do a range four. It runs faster and it's safer. And later, lots of other things happen. I mean, templates means that I can have uh, containers and algorithms uh, working with different types so that I uh, don't have to do code again and again and again. If I do boring things, I make mistakes. Um, automating the creation of vectors of everything uh, saves me. Uh, algorithms, uh, we started with the model that we got from Alex Stefanov, brilliant model, where uh, algorithms work from a beginning to an end. And this is good, and you can now do half a container from the beginning to the middle and all of that. This is very general, it's beautiful, but it fails the criteria of making simple things simple. I was always very annoyed of having to say sort begin of V and end of V. Why can't I just say sort of V? Okay, we can do that now. There are bugs you cannot make if you do that, like you cannot uh, try and sort from the end to the beginning or from the uh, beginning of something to the end of something else. Uh, again, the type system helps avoid bugs. I hate debugging, and therefore I, I like things uh, for the compiler to find it for me. And uh, exceptions, guaranteed um, error handling or termination, um, this I think uh, helps a lot because in any large program, people who try to find all the uh, errors and check for them don't find all the errors. So uh, this actually, in my opinion, is a reliability feature. That was how it was thought of. It was how it was introduced. And unfortunately, I didn't articulate my ideas clearly enough. So a lot of people uh, didn't quite understand it. Uh, misused uh, templates, uh, misused exceptions, and then decided they were no good. So I, I did articulate a lot of things uh, in the DNA, uh, Design and Evolution of, uh, of C++, that's from 94. Um, I made those rules up as I went along when I realized when you're designing a language, everybody wants some new feature from you. Uh, the thing that happens to me every, uh, Every month, every couple of weeks, people come and say, oh, C++ is too complicated. You must simplify it. Okay, I agree. I agree. It's too complicated. By the way, why you do it, I want these two features, two extra features. They're absolutely necessary. I needed them yesterday. And whatever you do, don't break my code. Okay, this is impossible. So... What I try to do is you cannot simplify the language because, uh, and throw things out because then you break people's code and they get very, very angry and they don't upgrade their compiler and they don't upgrade their libraries and things like that. The, the best you can do is to simplify use. Show them something that is simpler, safer, faster, like span. I mean, implementing a span, a, a really simple implementation of it can be done in about 10 minutes. Uh, uh, industrial scale one is something else. Uh, but still, uh, I missed articulation of um, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, I didn't say make simple tasks simple in the book. That was unfortunate. And I didn't explain error handling well enough. And uh, we are all paying for it today. Uh, on the other hand, notice no implicit violations of the static type system. It's there, that's type safety. And leave no room for a lower level language except the simpler, so we can't off, uh, offshore the uh, handling of, of nasty things. Uh, let's see. Um, I also wanted to get rid of the uh, preprocessor, which, uh, is, is a problem, uh, it's slow, it's error prone, etc. cetera. And uh, I'm now writing code without any macros and any includes in it, it's great. If you haven't tried um, modules, um, do. It's, it's, it's very, very powerful. Um, I, I'm using uh, module STD all the time now. Uh, saves me a lot of compile time, it saves me a lot of having to remember where all of these things are in the library. Okay, so 
A long time ago, like somewhere in the Nords, I was working on uh, guidelines for writing code. Oh, by the way, that's where you get all your uh, high-performance computers from. Uh, that's uh, X-ray lithography. Um, Anyway, I was working on the core guidelines and as it were for, for planes and, uh, oh, thank you, uh, for, for planes. And so I, I, I started what, what's now is the core guidelines uh, by, by saying, well, how can you give guidance for writing good code as opposed to just saying what the standard says? Because everything the standard is, they define what's legal but a lot of legal things doesn't make any sense. Um, especially it doesn't make any sense once we've got better things. So what is good modern C++? And I soon found that I wasn't the only one worrying about these things and making guidelines. So I worked with, with several people from a uh, diverse set of, um, of organizations. Uh, that was good. So we needed to get something that was a useful answer, not just a theoretical answer, and we wanted many people to be able to use that answer, so it has to be a reasonably simple answer. So my ideal was very simple. You have a set of rules which works in a conceptual framework, and if you violate them, the static analyzer tells you you violated it and why, what it was you violated and what you can do instead. That's the idea. The idea is you sit there coding, and when you violate it, when you run the compiler or the checker, it'll tell you not just that you messed up again, you knew that, but uh, that roughly why and how you can get out of the mess. So this is the thing like, people complain a lot, doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do X, so don't do X. So let's get, help people not to do the things that hurt them. Okay. Simple. So we all hate coding rules, unfortunately. We all write code the way we want to write it, and we're pretty convinced that what we are doing makes sense. Um, also, coding rules are usually written by, um, very often, people who have very little experience with C++. Um, I find that a lot of industrial coding rules were written by people just when they introduced C++. They were scared stiff about features that wasn't in their previous language, and they had a couple of uh, newbies coming in from the university to ask them to write the rules for them because they had been taught the language. This is not a good way. This is, uh, we, we are trying to do better. And uh, we focus on things that affects the design and yes, safety, type safety, uh, on um, on uh, what's it called? Uh, it, not not on how you spell your names and things like that. And and by the way, my work on coding guidelines started on the George Trifiger. I picked a picture of it from the Israeli Air Force, so uh, I guess guess it's okay. Um, the coding guidelines built. Let's build some good ones. For modern C++, I should say for contemporary C++, because the language evolves. And it has to be teachable, um, otherwise people can't follow the rules, even with help. Flexible, non-proprietary, good stuff like that. So there has to be a conceptual framework around it. And so if you go to the web and you find the core guidelines there on GitHub, uh, you just search for it, uh, you'll find that the first 25 pages is actually a discussion of philosophy of writing better code. It's in the intellectual for, uh, uh, framework for it, and you can see things like, we are writing ISO standard C++. I don't want another language. If you, uh, if you write a new language, either you fail, which is miserable, <clears throat> or you succeed and you get sort of 10 years of manual labor meaning 10 years of labor on the manual. And uh, express intent, statically type safe, uh, et cetera. Prefer compile time checking to runtime checking. Compile time checking costs you compile time, but you can all, compilers are pretty good. And you don't have to debug. I hate debugging, I mentioned that. And so that's the, the framework. And then a framework doesn't, really give concrete help. So you have to find specific rules that can be checked by checkers. So basically the idea is that the specific rules, which is 
90% of the core guidelines is basically to find that way through the, the forest. Um, so that's easy. Help to unify style, um, help guide people that build tools to, to support this. And the, the rules themselves are not uh, minimal or orthogonal. They just attack problems as we uh, find they're important. And eventually, they are meant to fill out the uh, intellectual framework that we saw on the previous slide. And, and we are actually there so that people have run checkers on million line programs and gotten no leaks, no type violations. I'll, I'll get to further that. The idea is to be a, uh, a subset of a superset. A lot of people want to get safety by subsetting, uh, and that doesn't work because the really key features for a, a lot of hardware manipulation, for a lot of low-level performance, is exactly the features that aren't safe. And they are messy and bug, uh, uh, relatively bug, uh, vulnerable to bugs, like the raw pointer. Um, so how do we get to, to, to avoid that? You hide that stuff that's necessary inside other things. So you hide the pointer inside a span. You hide pointers inside a vector or arrays inside a vector. And now you can do range checking and all the other good stuff. So first, you superset the language basically with libraries. And now you can subset that set and say, don't use a raw pointer for anything to, than pointing to something. Don't use it as an iterator. And um, we want to use the, uh, the standard library. Um, we would like to get more things into the standard library so that we can put the uh, GSL, the guideline support library, out of business. And uh, I mean, the STL is now in the standard, so we have some successes. What we want is C++ and steroids, not some, some limited thing. OK, uh, and some rules rely on libraries. You can't express this kind of thing without libraries. And we know how to deal with uh, resources. Just uh, use RAII. That's how vectors, strings, streams, et cetera, fine. And uh, I saw somebody with a T-shirt that said, uh, was trying to tell uh, his grandma that he didn't use uh, new and delete anymore. That's right, they should be hidden inside resource handles. Uh, that's a leaky pipe there, we don't want that. And so the real problem here to a lot of the C and C++ code is, is, is dangling pointers. If we can handle that, we can do a lot of things. If we can't handle that, we're sort of lost. So here is some innocent looking code. I have a pointer, I delete it. Fine, looks good, it's legal. It says uh, the manual, the, the standard says what it does. Here I'm making an object, I'm giving it to there, and then I go and use it. I mean, you all see what's wrong with this. There is no object by the time we get down there because it has been deleted up there. This kind of code has to go. The only problem is, of course, that this looks uh, innocent, this looks innocent, and it works most of the time. Because most of the time, you have deleted the object, and it hasn't been recycled, so it works. Now, you, a week later, uh, something crashes because the behavior of the program changed so that this got corrupted. Okay, there's several ways of dealing with this. You could try and protect um, your free store for use after uh, delete, but uh, this, this might actually point to a, an array, uh, not, a, uh, not, not a new, and so we, we have to do better than this. That, that's my, the best picture I found on the web of a nightmare. And so we must do it. It has to be solved. It's fundamental. Otherwise, we can't have type checking if uh, some of your code scribbles or some of my code uh, on data. That, that doesn't work. OK. So we deal with that. And the, the answer is quite simple. I mean, you don't allow a pointer to exist outside the scope of the object it points to. So I can pass a pointer to somebody I call, and it comes back. If I try to pass it to, to some, something that outlives the object, I mustn't do that. So this is fairly principled, and then you go through the 
maybe a hundred places in the language where uh, you could get the pointer out of scope of the, its object, and you had the static analyzer catch them. And so basically this doesn't work because this is supposed to point to an object and not be an owner. An owner is somebody with the responsibility of deleting. So this gets complaint, the, the static checker complains about that one. It may or may not complain about that one, um, but uh, it'll, it'll certainly complain that this owner has, there's no owner there, that there's no delete. Um, so that, that, that'll take care of, so this can be taken care of. Fundamentally, it's simple. The details are plentiful and hard to get right. So how do we represent ownership? We can mess at that level, and we do. There's an annotation called an owner that's used by the uh, guideline static library so that you can do really low level stuff like that. It's useful when you have to pass to a, an interface that is not in C++ and you need ABI compatibility and things like that. On the other hand, the recommendation is to use uh, ownership abstractions. A vector owns its, its elements, a unique pointer uh, remembers to delete what it's pointing to. A shared pointer shares ownership. Use those abstractions. Don't mess with the low-level stuff. Use the low-level stuff to implement the high-level stuff and then use the high-level stuff. That means there's far less use of these uh, um, dangerous uh, things. And by the way, when I talk about pointers, of course, I mean anything that can point, anything that can refer to an object. And so you, you have to deal with it. Uh, here, here's uh, an example. Um, I, I have a, a, a simple function here, and it does things. It collects a set of pointers to something. Consider you are sending elements of one of your vectors to an algorithm. Um, you, you have to do something like that. It doesn't actually matter who owns it. But once you start passing it out and returning things, you have to make sure that uh, you only uh, let es pointers escape if they actually live outside. So the new can be passed out, except we have probably forgot about ownership, so there's another rule catching that. If there's a global element somewhere, um, you can pass a pointer to that because the global object is still in scope. But a local, forget it. And uh, dangling pointers again, another sample, you're, uh, uh, you're adding ownership to things to make sure that it's easily checked. Actually, what you should do is use a higher level abstraction to not to have to mess with that. And so this is very rare code. I, 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 I have written code with that, but I don't like it. It's too low level. It's, it's like using the pointers. Uh, you, you're managing things directly. Uh, the other thing that's actually worse is, uh, is invalidation, but that can be handled uh, with the cost of um, quite significant problems to old style code. So here we have a, a function that takes a vector and then it does a pushback. This may or may not reall reallocate everything in uh, the uh, vector, which means that if you have down here in G, if you had done what I did there, I grab a pointer to, in, to, to, to inside the vector, the first element, then I call this one. All the elements may move. So this one may not point anywhere, and now I write to it, and again, it's one of these nasty things. Most of the time, it works. I hate transient box. And, but, so we, we have to make sure that uh, this doesn't happen. Um, doing it dynamically is a real pain, um, and we're doing it statically. Uh, we, we check for invalidation at, um, at compile time. At, sorry, it's not the compiler, it's the static analyzer. So invalidated, uh, there's a definition to it. A container is anything that holds, um, holds objects so that you can point to them and they might get reallocated. Classes with pointer members, uh, I mean a vector has, a, has three pointers inside it. 
lambdas. I want to try to beat the, uh, um, the static analyzer. Of course, that's what you do when you're trying to see if things work. I was trying to be sneaky. I was, um, I was returning a lambda with a binding to a uh, local uh, variable. That, that's a kind of a pointer to a local variable. The static analyzer stopped me. This was two years ago. This is not brand new. Uh, references to pointers, arrays of pointers, uh, threads. A thread is a container. It has stuff in it, so you can you can handle uh, things that goes in there. Okay. And then there's the problems that require uh, runtime checking. Uh, that that's another monster. Not quite as bad as the nightmare, but uh, it's, it's 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 not nice. So basically. Uh, Use span rather than pointers. Don't ever subscript a pointer except inside the implementation of a, um, a, a, some, something, a, a resource handler. Check null pointers. Um, don't use unions. Use variants. Uh, don't write casts. Um, the uh, Joint Strike Fighter uh, guideline says you need a supervisor's uh, permission to write a cast. Um, Casts are not very useful when you write modern C++. I mean, why, why mess with the type system? Yes, you have to when you get stuff in from the outside and, and when it comes back, if, if, if you don't know the origins of it, you are in sort of trouble, but you have to do it. Um, I'm not discussing over and underflow and data races here. There just isn't time, but we're working on that too. Okay, so <clears throat> how can we standardize this? How can we uh, get this to be guaranteed so that everybody can use these ideas? I mean, I would very much like to have the guarantee that I never had a dangling pointer. Um, I can do that by following the rules, but following the rules, I, I don't know anybody who's really, really good at that. Uh, here, here's another example of some good C++ code where it's hard to send a repairman. So how do we guarantee this? Guidelines is not enough, as I said. And, and basically, um, there's an overview of what we are doing here. Um, we stick to ISO C++. I don't want a new language. It's just too difficult. Dialects are too difficult. You can't communicate. You can't share with people that's using some non-standard uh, version of it, or it's hard to interact with a, with a different language. Um, you have to have uh, type and, and resource safety for just about any form of safety. Um, and we deal with ownership. Um, the set of guarantees we want to do is open. I'll have a list of that somewhere, what I want. I don't see the list here. Yeah. Yeah, this is what I'm referring to. Um, each of these things uh, can be seen as a way of getting problems, a way of violating safety. Logic areas, um, that's the ones we make ourselves and uh, it's very hard for uh, a type system or anything else to catch it. So uh, memory corruption, that's the one people go on about these days, but it's not the only one. Concurrency errors, yeah, we can deal with a lot of that. Resource leaks, my traditional stomping ground and uh, something we know how to deal with. Overflows, non-anticipated conversions, uh, they are really nasty. They happen in other languages too. There was the, um, the ADA problem with the Patriot missiles that were shooting down uh, non-existent um, rockets around here uh, 10 years ago. And um, timing errors. It, it's, it's really, you, you have to run fast enough. Quite often, how fast enough is good enough. You don't have to op, be optimal. But if you have to, to do something to a fuel injector in a given time, a little bit later, you have a bad engine. If it's a control system, my brakes may not work anymore. Uh, so timing is important. Allocation on predictability. A lot of flight software is not allowed to use uh, free store because you can't guarantee the uh, regular um, timing. So there's a lot of things here. So safety is not one thing. This is, this is one of my main theses here. Uh, I want to address what is relevant for a given application. Not all applications have the same constraints. 
and people want to be constrained to do what they need to be constrained for, they don't want your constraints if they're different. If you just want to make everything safe in every possible way, you end up with a very impoverished um, language. So what was I saying? Yeah. Uh, why does not just use the compiler? Just impose the set of rules. Well, I just told you why not. It's, it, it's, it's uh, not good enough for anybody because it's a subset of, of, of what everybody uh, can live with. Uh, billions of lines of code, millions of programmers, different definitions. We need gradual adoption. We can't convert these millions of programmers and billions of lines of code overnight. And we would like a st static analyzer that's platform independent. We don't have that. There's some in, um, in Clang Tidy and there's a lot in the Microsoft um, the static analyzer, uh, mostly thanks to um, Gabby Ross Reyes and uh, Herb Sauter. Um, and uh, we want uniform adoption of basic type and safety rules. That is, we would like it to be easy for you to write type and resource safe code. And so you have to make some eff extra effort if you want to um, do something that it isn't safe for that fundamental notion of safety. And then we can add other kinds of safety where needed. And in a lot of cases, people won't even go for type and uh, resource safety. The invalidation thing is, is really harsh. Uh, so you probably can't do it tomorrow. I can't do it tomorrow for everything I want. But you know, not every piece of code is safety critical where safety means lives. Or and when I worked for the bank, uh, losing your uh, money, uh, not allowed. There's actually a law against losing that kind of data. It doesn't kill anybody, but that's a different set of constraints. Okay, so there was a set of, uh, of different uh, safety issues that I cranked out in a hurry. I'm sure I could double it. Um, and so my conclusion is that you can't just have the compiler enforce everything all the time. So arbitrary C++ code is simply too complex for static analysis. I mean, you're up against the haunting problem. It is impossible. Furthermore, you add dynamic linking, the cost of global analysis, and uh, the need to directly access hardware with strange properties, you can't do it. So you have to restrict the code you write to the kind of code for which guarantees can be provided. And uh, also, we need performance ever so long. Uh, so coherent set of rules, not just random rules. A lot of people saying, I'll fix this problem. I'll fix this problem. I'll fix this problem. It doesn't add up to a universal guarantee that can be expressed. You have to say, I want this fundamental thing. Every object is used in according to its definition. That's not a, 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 a simple uh, fixed to a compiler. It is, it is a philosophical statement that you can then approximate. Um, and it must uh, be visible in code what we are requiring. Uh, we did the core guidelines. That was all done with tools. And that means that if I look at your piece of code, I don't know what kind of safety or what degree of safety you were interested in. Uh, you should be, we should be able to write in our code this code is supposed to be type and resource safe. And now I can read the code and see what, uh, what uh, it's supposed to do. I can run the checker to make sure that it really does that. I can, uh, I, I can reason about it. Uh, that's not in the core guidelines. They are just guidelines. We, we need something more. So the, the, stri the strategy is, is quite simple. We need static analysis to ver verify that the unsafe code for some definition of unsafe is uh, not executed. Uh, we do that uh, by uh, having rules that simplify the kind of code we write so that the analysis is possible. And then we use libraries to make the code we write uh, nice instead of fiddling around with low level things trying to go through this maze uh, on our own. So it's like a drug cocktail. The way I thought about it first was I was uh, 
I'd heard about these ideas for dealing with diseases. They can handle one drug, they can handle another drug. If you give them two at the same time, very few bugs escape, give them three and they all die. So that's the, my idea of how to catch bugs. Um, people are saying this is just too new, it's too strange. Um, and people quoted uh, Homer Simpson, don't do anything new, just do something familiar and put a feature on it. Um, I think we have to do something fundamental. Your code is not going to become safe uh, by, by magic. Some of it is going to be painful. Not all is. I mean, there's a lot of code that, that doesn't have to fulfill every the detail here. But some of the ones where you want a guarantee, you, you, you may not be able to use your favorite trick. And uh, we, 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 uh, we have seen this kind of approach worked with guidelines and other things. So it's not a brand new idea. I mean, I've been working on this for a couple of decades. Um, we need a combined and coherent approach. And uh, we're not the only ones doing it. Once I was doing this, somebody said, hey, O on ADA, they have something similar. And you know, it's called the same thing. It's the same idea. It's called profiles, um, sort of convergent evolution or something. Um, we, we, we even picked the same name. Uh, and uh, so we have to go beyond uh, Guidelines, the hardest problem actually is to mix profiles. Uh, you saw 10 different uh, ways of writing a profile. What happens when I call code that doesn't obey my uh, favorite profile? What happens when I get code called by somebody that isn't using my favorite profile? That's a hard problem. This is, you, you, you've seen it many times when you communicate with another language. Uh, pass a pointer from C++ over to Java, uh, make sure the garbage collector doesn't start messing with your code. And so we're, we're trying to deal with that. That's, uh, that's still open. Uh, that's a hard problem. Uh, mixing profiles, yep. And uh, so there's some ideas of how to deal with this. Um, you, you can put a, um, ex on an export, you can say what you're providing, and import, you can say uh, which things you want to enable, whether it's uh, been done or not from the other end. Um, import a module where suppressing the uh, type safety. Now you can start doing nasty things and sending pointers back to the other one, but there has to be a way of communicating between different forms of safety guarantee and there can be in code controls, suppress a particular pro profile, or enforce a particular profile even if it isn't guaranteed from whoever gave you the pointer. Notice that suppressed type safety is this um, trusted code thing that sort of uh, turns off all guarantees in the safe languages, uh, or a, a call to C. Okay, and then I'm going to suggest a couple of uh, standard um, profiles that I would like to see available in every implementation. Type safety, which is what I've been talking, no type and resource violations. Range, which simply checks that you are not out of range. And arithmetic uh, for making sure that you, you don't overflow and such. Okay, so there's a summary of here. I'm not going to go great into it. Uh, a lot of this stuff comes out of the core guidelines, but would like to get it standardized. There's the owner for saying that a pointer points to something that must be deleted so that you can enforce that. If anybody deletes something that isn't an owner, it will not pass. If somebody doesn't delete something that is an owner, it will not pass unless you passed it to somebody else. Uh, not null, checking that the pointer isn't null in one place. Not end, which is a version of that when you are dealing with the uh, end of uh, 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 a sequence. Okay, so are we there yet? Uh, no. Um, I think I can see the where we can, can be at, at, at the end for some definition, but the world is changing, different guarantees will be needed, but we'll come a long way. I mean, classic C is just very different. Uh, C with classes did a little bit better. C++ uh, plus plus 11 did even better. C++ plus plus 20 does even better still. 
uh, but we're not quite at the end. We need to distinguish between what's legal and what makes sense according to our definition, and uh, we can get there. Do we have time for questions? Yes. We are running a little bit uh, late because we started a bit early, uh, a bit later. But uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and, uh, thank you. So uh, we'll take some questions. Um, I think it's better to just come up here and uh, we'll start in this room and then we'll move to the other room and then talk for additional questions. So uh, you're free to line up here. And I'll take the first person. So uh, one of the fundamental mechanisms in C++ that you mentioned in the talk is RAII, uh, which is used for many things, uh, among which is, is, uh, uh, is ensuring safety. But uh, efficiency of RAII is uh, the problem of uh, failures during destruction. Sometimes there are kinds of resources where the release of the resource can fail, but we don't want the entire program to immediately die. And I was wondering how that fits in with your ideas about moving towards safety, maybe with Let's profiles, etc. Yeah, remember what I said about being engineers? Um, you can do 99 or 99.9% .9 of the solution, and then you can do something else at the end. And what I have seen done, uh, especially with sockets in distributed systems, uh, this was in finance. So, but anyway, what you do is you, uh, you, you check uh, whether the uh, socket wants to close. And if the other end of the wire, of the wire doesn't agree, you can't uh, deal with it. So what you do is you put that resource on a cleanup list and then return. And then you have a regular um, different system that goes around and, uh, and cleans up the things that couldn't be done in the simple way. And almost all cases is not that. But, but have a, um, a, a, a list of resources that need special attention. Um, the list is usually empty. So uh, it's not too bad, but that's the technique. That's a general technique. Uh, two things. The first one is more uh, of an observation: is that uh, it seems we always need to compromise something. So most of the constructs and elements of the modern language indeed gives us safety, but uh, I find that sometimes it's at the cost of performance. And indeed, if it involves computation. Usually most of it uh, is neglectable, if uh, any, but uh, some of them are not. But then, okay, so I can compile a optimization and get what I want in regards to performance. However, um, I find it that sometimes it's a bit of challenging to debug uh, an optimized code. And um, so, and, and some of the problems happen all of, so only when you get to full scale in which you need the, already the unoptimized code to be um, capable to support. So it's an observation that we always need to compromise something. So if you have any comment about that? Or... Yeah, I agree. Um, that is, there are some things that are uh, beyond uh, static uh, validation. And we have to have a way of getting to it. My, my favorite example is the calling odd hardware that the compiler writer, the static analyzer, has never heard of. Uh, the other one is some data structures are just impossible to implement with static guarantees for control. I mean, try a general graph. Um, my solution to that, by the way, is separating ownership from what you're pointing to. There are solutions, but sometimes you have to turn off the safety profile or you have to go to a different uh, safety profile. It's part of the reason we can't just have one thing for everybody. Okay, and the second thing is that the encounter um, many people tell me it's uh, sometimes arguable 
whether we need naming conventions or we don't. And then uh, only a couple of weeks ago, I encountered some code that uh, did not enforce any name convention. So the name of the data member could be the same of the name of the parameter to the uh, function. And then there was a, a variable hiding resulting of this, or sometimes I just find myself need to convert from an integral variable into a floating point variable. So don't have any name convention resulting in something which is uh, giving free name just to express the same thing. And if I had the, the name convention, it would be easier just N or B with differentiate between the two. So, and this is one issue regarding naming. And another one is giving name convention sometimes help me or the start analyzer find great problems. For example, just again, a couple of weeks ago, I encountered the fact that we do enforce name conventions the static analyzer found something that was supposed to be a reference, but someone forgot and omitted the ampersand symbol, so it wasn't a reference, but instead it was a copy by value. So uh, naming conventions can be very useful, but there's lots of them. And uh, if you are in a large organization, uh, it's really hard to standardize on a naming convention. And then you merge with another company that had a different one. And now you have two naming conventions. And two is a very low number for this. So I'm not a great fan of naming conventions. I'm a great fan of types. Uh, I think Hungarian notation is evil and damaging. Um, that is, if you, you want to have, my ideal is generic code. And naming conventions that embed the type of an object or the scope of the object inside the name uh, gets in the way of abstraction. It gets in the way of generic things. It gets in the way of changing. So naming conventions can be useful. Naming conventions are, in, uh, are unavoidable and people have holy wars uh, or which is the right one. Um, I like underscores and I don't like camel case, uh, but that's just my um, preference. The core guideline says uh, try and stick to one uh, naming convention and we're not going to tell you which one it is. And um, that we got beaten up on badly. So we, uh, I wrote something says, and if you have to have one, you don't have one, you could, might think of this one. But uh, it, it, that is the strongest advice I'll give on naming conventions. It's if, if you can't think of anything else, try this. I can't help it to, to mention that Java have a, have a name convention and it violates it for its own types, for its own building types. But yeah, that's, uh, you kind of answered it uh, for the previous uh, question, um, but you mentioned that you want the compiler to, or the static analyzer to, to warn of errors and you want, you said you don't want the runtime, uh, runtime overhead. And then I can pull the joker that says concurrency. If, if I want to share PTR, but I need to access it from multiple threads, then I need runtime support for that. And then I don't want to pay for that support if I'm not using multiple threads. Um, that, that's obviously a hard problem. Um, and uh, th th there are, are solutions. Um, I don't know a universal one. one. One thing I have used is a uh, null mutex. That is, you protect your uh, data with a mutex. Uh, this is mutex, just one example. And uh, that costs things. What if you're running single threaded? The answer is you put in a null mutex that doesn't have any, it doesn't do anything, it's optimized away. Uh, so that you can write your code as if it was concurrent with protections, and then you can um, then then you can optimize it away for single threaded. There's not that much single threaded code because people think they're single threaded, and then they call the uh, call the GUI, and they find they aren't anymore. The other thing that can be done is to have abstractions that takes these kind of things into account. 
on the list of things that was recommended by the core guidelines was a dynamic uh, vector, din, din, din array, I think it was called, uh, which is a vector that you can't change the size of. And the reason for that is that when you can't change the size, you can't uh, invalidate it, so you don't have to, to check about invalidation. So the vector is too hard to uh, handle in a distributed system, in a, in a concurrent system, but then array is much easier. So you can have um, abstractions that are helping with this. Uh, the other thing is um, a unique pointer or a variant of unique pointer. Uh, since there's only one pointer to it, if you have one that you don't extract a pointer from, which a static analyzer can guarantee, then you are the only one that points to the object. So obviously you don't have to synchronize it uh, because nobody else has it. So unique pointer as it stands uh, can break that, but with static analysis support so that you don't extract pointers from it or an abstraction that is like unique pointer or where you can't extract the pointer will solve some of these problems. As I said, I don't have a general solution, but there are many particular solutions. And, and by the way, uh, yes, uh, you can try and in back to what you said about Java. If you have an owner and you can, and you have a central authority, you can uh, enforce some rules, but C++ has always been uh, without such a thing. Thanks for the talk, very inspiring. Um, I wanted to ask about your thoughts uh, for uh, the future evolution and the backwards compatibility of the safety profiles, meaning uh, if a certain piece of code or module uh, adheres to a certain profile, would it make sense uh, if a new version of the language or new, are the new versions of profiles, would they break uh, existing code or not? Um, since, since I've never tried this at scale, the, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, I do think about the problem and my guess is that only a subset of the most important rules will be in the standard will be standardized and my guess is that those could be things that don't change very often i mean type and resource safe as i defined it hasn't changed for i mean it's true for just about any language for the last few decades. Um, so, and if you make a radical change, make a new one. So don't 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 try and, and, and fix the old one in major ways. Minor ways, yeah, fine, we can live with that. But incompatibilities, breaking old code, is very very hard to deal with. People always underestimate the uh, breakage, and you can always provide a new version. People complain about, say, the hash table in the standard is not as efficient as it could be. Um, it was designed uh, some time ago. And so pe some people say, let's fix it. And I'm saying, just build a new one. Give it a different name. Uh, you can do that yourself. You don't have to bother with the standards committee for that. And if it's if your version is so great, uh, maybe it'll be adopted by the standard. And the same, I think, will be the case for profiles. A lot of profiles will be uh, corporate or um, domain specific or industry specific, and they won't be in the standard. They will be under your control. Hey, so uh, you've mentioned in the talk about some uh, checks that uh, we don't perform at Compile in order not to break uh, lexicon. But one thing I wonder about is the uh, uh, specification of the state of an object after it has been moved, which has been defined from the get-go to allow performance operation on it uh, even after the uh, move operation has occurred, um, which uh, uh, kind of baffles me because I'm not sure. I mean, this issue uh, obviously causes a lot of bugs for the main developers uh, when an object uh, doesn't really, isn't really supposed to be used. Um, there's been lots of discussions about the, uh, the, the state of an object uh, after a move. The core guideline says leave it in a valid state. 
And uh, that, that's a pretty good definition. It's the same as the most of the standard library uh, does. Uh, or at least if they, to be more precise, you have to be able to assign to it uh, so that you can give it a new value. Um, there are some extreme performance situations where you don't even want that. I'm not sure I really believe that. And the core guidelines says you will have to violate the core guidelines for doing it. Um, it as little we can do to the standard, but a safety profile will define something. And my favorite idea of a safety profile will say, leave it in a valid state. And you mentioned uh, that the strong backward compatibility uh, is a challenge for uh, the complexity and the error proneness of the language. And uh, I think that we've seen lately uh, other approaches to deprecate old and um, features in other languages other than 100% or 99.9% of backward compatibility. For example, a uh, programma uh, new version in F sharp or automatic uh, automatic refactoring that converts old code to 100 100% identical new code and that you can see in the Golan. Um, it's C plus plus considered such approaches for deprecating old and problematic features. Uh, we have tried to deprecate things many times. It didn't work. Uh, people leaned on the compiler vendors to make sure that they didn't implement the new rule that broke something or deprecated something. They wouldn't even have the warnings. We won't buy your compiler and your uh, tool set unless um, you uh, have to set a special feature to get the standard language. So that's very hard. Uh, secondly, we don't have a central authority. Uh, a lot of the languages that can manage to, to break things can do it because they can give people no choice. I mean, the one true compiler for this language issued by their owner, well, if you, especially if there's a central thing so that you can invalidate the compilers, uh, you can force people. Force doesn't work in C in the C++ world. I have seen people use compilers that's been outdated for 20 years <laughs> because they didn't want uh, some of this new stuff they didn't like. And especially rules that break code, they resist vigorously. We have to, I think, do a different approach. And the approach I'm choosing is guidelines that will let you write in a much simpler language uh, there, there's just a lot of things you can't do within the guidelines. And profiles uh, take that philosophy. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, my question is more like a people question, business question. Like I'm convinced of all the things you said, how I'm going to take it to my team, to my organizations. Because although they will agree that safety is important, we still need to keep developing new things, new features, and how can I make the argument for oh, let's, let's work on safety and change our code? There are two kinds of arguments. There's the arguments that I've been doing here. I've been trying to convince you with logic that this is a good approach and that you should understand it and do it. The other argument is the European Union has a law that says we will not buy software unless it follows the rules. The NSA says we are not allowed to use any of this software in uh, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, if you, if you don't believe in the logic, sooner or later some government organization will put, punish you for not doing it. We better do something. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned something in the beginning to the extent of the language not forcing us to write ways. Um, on the other hand, I would say there are some cases that the language does go to some extent in, in sometimes forcefully trying to prevent us from writing in code. 
And the example that comes to mind is uh, this allowing uh, the binding of temporary objects to non ones uh, references. So how do you see that perhaps uh, we start from um, Let's see. Historically, neither I nor the Standards Committee has been able to force people to do things. Um, as my previous answer, there are other people that are less uh, touchy-feely than I am. Uh, they, they will force you. Um, in the very old days, you could bind um, a const uh, to, a, uh, to, to, to a reference or a temporary to a reference. And I just saw a lot of bugs and I changed the rules because that was just me. And uh, I had few enough users so that I could do it. Uh, you couldn't do that today. Um, the, the, the point is there's so much code out there that whatever you do, somebody will have used it and will object strongly. So I, I decided force will not work, bans will not work, deprecation will not work. We've tried them all repeatedly. Guidelines and profiles might actually work because you can pick um, uh, pick the profile that you need when you need it and not use it when you don't. Um. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Gordon, for joining us.